You've almost certainly heard of Isaac Newton, and you might have heard of Robert Hooke. What you probably don't realise is that these two 17th century scientists have had a crucial effect on the science of suspension design. Newton is probably most famous for inventing gravity, but he also devised three laws of motion that bear his name. So Newton's first law of motion says that bodies only move if you move them. A body will remain at rest or will remain in motion unless it's acted upon by an external force. And that works in three dimensions. So if a body is moving horizontally, it isn't moving vertically unless something acts upon it, unless a force acts upon it. Newton's second law says that the acceleration of a body is proportional to the force that's acting upon it. So the more force, the faster a thing accelerates, and is inversely proportional to its mass. So the heavier a thing is, the harder it is to make it accelerate. And Newton's final law, his third law, says that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you push from one side, something has to push back from the other side. Hooke's most famous law applies to springs. Hooke found that the force that a spring generates is in direct proportion to the amount it compresses. Or indeed the other way around. The amount of force you apply to a spring is in direct proportion to the, the amount of compression that you get in it. So how is this relevant to suspension design? Well, I've made a little model to illustrate what we're talking about and to show how Newton's laws and Hooke's law applies to suspension and the behaviour of those suspension systems. So let's go through that. So here we have a mass that is supported by a spring that is resting on the ground and it's moving at a velocity of 10 metres per second or about 36 kilometres per hour and it's approaching a ramp and the ramp is 0.1 metres long and 0.1 metres high so it's at an angle of 45 degrees. So when the body reaches the ramp what's going to happen? What do Hook and Newton say will happen? So Newton's first law says well the body is moving horizontally but it's not moving vertically so it's not going to move vertically unless a force acts upon it. Newton's second law says that the force that acts on that body is proportionate to its mass and the acceleration acting on it. So when the spring reaches the ramp, the spring is going to have to apply a force to the mass in order to lift it up. And that means that the length of the spring is going to shorten. And the amount of force it generates is going to be proportionate to how much its length changes by. The horizontal velocity of the body is important because that's also going to dictate the vertical velocity. Now that's important because the faster the body is moving horizontally, the faster it will have to move vertically once it gets to the ramp for the spring to remain in equilibrium. So for the force in the spring to remain the same as it is when at normal ride height. So essentially the faster the body moves horizontally, the higher will be the vertical acceleration when it gets to the ramp and therefore the higher will be the force in the spring. So, a spring doesn't care how fast you compress it. So the only thing that a spring is interested in is how far you have compressed it. So, how, how much you've compressed it by. It doesn't care how fast you put that compression in. So it is entirely displacement dependent, it is not velocity dependent. The only thing a damper cares about, it doesn't care the position it's in, it doesn't care about displacement within its working range. The only thing it's interested in is how fast it is moved there. So a spring is displacement dependent and a damper is velocity dependent. So in this example, the mass of my body is 250 kilos. So that might be, say, the corner weight of a big ATV or something like that. The spring rate of my spring is 10,000 newtons per meter. 
That combination of a 10,000 Newton per metre spring rate and a 250 kilogram corner weight gives us a natural frequency of almost exactly one hertz. So when we get to the ramp, the spring is going to compress by the height of the ramp, which is 0.1 metres. So we can work out how much force the spring is going to apply to the body by multiplying that 0.1 metres of compression by the rate of the spring, which is 10,000. So 0.1 multiplied by 10,000 is 1,000 newtons. So we've got a 1,000 newton force being applied to the body, which will accelerate the body upwards. Now remember, Newton's second law says force is mass times acceleration. So we have 1,000 newtons of force and a mass of 250 kilos. So we have an acceleration of 4 meters per second squared. So with a body at rest, the spring is generating a force sufficient to support the weight of the mass. So in this case, we've got a mass of 250 kilos and we're generating a bit less than two and a half thousand newtons of force to keep it up there because the force due to gravity is the mass multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity, which is 9.81, so a bit less than 10. So the force that the spring is generating is just a bit less than 10 times the mass. Um, you can see that the vertical acceleration of the body uh, is zero at this point, it's sitting stationary. As it moves along and gets to the ramp, the ramp forces the spring to compress and that increases the force acting on the body and causes it to accelerate upwards. That 1000 Newton force generates an acceleration of four meters per second squared in the body. So now the body is moving upwards, accelerating upwards at a rate of four meters per second squared. Now, of course, once it's moving, you need another force to slow it down again. So in this case, gravity is gonna slow it down. Gravity is pulling down on it. So the spring accelerates it up at four meters per second squared, but gravity is pulling it down at 9.81 meters per second squared. So the body shoots up, it will go past its normal resting point because it's got some velocity. So once it's got some velocity, it will tend to remain in motion, but the force of gravity is trying to slow it down. So what happens when we get to the top of the ramp is that the body will start to oscillate. So the spring forces it up, it goes past its normal resting point, the point at which the force in the spring is balancing the weight of the mass. So it goes past that point with some velocity, gravity slows it down, gravity starts to pull it back down again, but then when it gets to its normal resting point, its normal ride height, it gets there with some velocity. So it'll go past that normal resting point and overshoot a bit, compress the spring, generate some more force. That compression in the spring will be turned into acceleration, which will accelerate the body back up again, and the spring will continue to oscillate. In my model, I haven't got any damping at all. If you did this in real life, there would be some damping in the various mechanisms that you have in the suspension. But in this nice, neat little simulation, we've got no damping at all, so the body will continue to oscillate forever, effectively. And so we come to dampers. So this little model illustrates that if we didn't have dampers, um, the energy that the spring absorbs would be immediately given back to the body, and we'd end up in a never-ending cycle of the body accelerating up and down, um, bouncing up and down on its springs. So we need dampers to take that energy out of the system. So the job of the damper is to convert that energy of motion that the suspension has absorbed and convert it into heat so that it can get rid of it. So if you drive very fast over rough terrain, you'll find that the dampers get extremely hot potentially hot enough for the paint to burn off. In a system that's critically damped, when the body oscillates, it will return back to its resting point without overshooting at all. So you hit a bump, the body moves up, and then it goes back to its normal resting point. 
Now, you might think that that would be ideal for vehicle suspension. Actually, that's far too much damping for the behaviour that we really want from a suspension. It would make our suspension far too stiff. The parameter we use in selecting damper behaviour is a thing called damping ratio. So this is the ratio of actual damping compared to critical damping. So for automotive applications, for cars and trucks and things, we normally go for a damping ratio of about 0.3. So what that means is we get three oscillations before the body returns to its normal position, before it returns to its normal ride height. So I've now added to my model a damper that gives us a damping ratio of 0.3. So what are the important characteristics of a damper? The important characteristics are the velocity that it's moving at and its coefficient, its damping coefficient. It's usually relatively easy um, to find information about the rate of springs. Uh, a lot of springs will actually have the rate printed on the side of it or there will be some information in the catalogue. Uh, for dampers it tends to be a lot harder. It's uh, unusual to see damping coefficients quoted in catalogues. Um, that's partly because it's actually much harder to measure the coefficient of dampers than it is to measure the rate of a spring. You can measure the rate of a spring fairly easily in a home workshop, whereas to measure the coefficient of a damper you need some fairly specialist and expensive equipment. So we've got a spring with a natural frequency of 1 hertz, and we've got a damper that has been tuned to give us a damping ratio of 0.3. So this is what happens when we drive our model up to the ramp with the damper in place. Our spring was generating a force of a thousand newtons, but now our damper is generating nine and a half thousand newtons. So the damper is actually generating a lot more force on the body than the spring was. But now when we get to the top of the ramp, you can see that the body settles back to its normal ride height within three oscillations, which is what we wanted our damper to do for us. But the force that the body experienced, and therefore anything or anybody inside the vehicle experienced, was a great deal higher than if we'd only had the spring in place. What this suggests is that we might like our dampers to act differently when they're being compressed to when they're extending. So perhaps we might like a damper that generates no force at all as it's being compressed, but then creates a force to resist the spring re-extending so we don't end up with that oscillation when the vehicle gets to the top of the ramp. OK, that's probably enough 17th century physics for one episode. Coming up in this series, we still need to talk about the effect of unsprung mass and what that's going to do to the handling of a vehicle. We also need to talk about the effects of wheel size and what that does to the behaviour of the suspension. And we still need to talk about rising rate suspension, why that might be a good idea and how you might achieve it. But all that is for future parts of this series. So in the meantime, thanks very much for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.